Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Open Mind, a community lecture and film series that brings together thought leaders at the intersection of science and culture for meaningful and relevant conversations about mental health. The Open Mind is proudly sponsored by UCLA's Friends of the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior and the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital Board of Advisors. I'm Vicki Goodman, and it is my honor to welcome and introduce today's featured speaker, Meg Kissinger, Pulitzer Prize finalist and author of the new, engaging, and critically acclaimed memoir, While You Were Out, an intimate family portrait of mental illness in an era of silence. Meg is joining us from her home in Milwaukee, where she lives along the shores of Lake Michigan and occasionally enjoys a plunge, even on the coldest days in January. She will be joined in discussion by Dr. David Miklowitz, Distinguished Professor of Psychiatry, Director of the Child and Adolescent Mood Disorders Program, and the Max Gray Fellowship for Mood Disorders at UCLA Semmel Institute. And because so many of you have asked, Meg Kissinger is not related to Henry Kissinger, although her family did have a dog named Henry, thus their own Henry Kissinger. Now, While You Were Out has been praised for its incisive reporting, boundless compassion, and surprising humor. Meg, one of eight children, grew up in Chicagoland at the height of the baby boom. Three members of her family attempted suicide, two successfully, Five, including both parents, had a serious mental illness. Meg worked for many years as an investigative reporter for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, traveling across the country to report on and expose the failings of our nation's mental health care system. She's won dozens of national awards, and while you were out, was named as an outstanding work of literature winner and an editor's choice by the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Amazon, Goodreads, and Independent Booksellers Association, and Audible chose it as best of the year. She taught investigative reporting at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism and is a trainer for the school's DART Center on Trauma and Journalism. Dr. David Miklowitz, along with the titles previously mentioned, is also a visiting professor of psychiatry at Oxford University in the UK. His research focuses on family environmental factors and family interventions for kids and adults with mood or psychotic disorders. His work has helped establish the effectiveness of psychosocial interventions as adjuncts to medication for bipolar disorder across age ranges. Dr. Miklowitz has received numerous awards for his research, including most recently the Distinguished Scientist Award from the Society for the Science of Clinical Psychology, and in 2020, the Mood Disorders Research Award from the American College of Psychiatrists, one of only two psychologists to have done so. He has received multiple research grants from the National Institute of Mental Health and 10 private foundations. He's published over 400 research articles and eight books, including the Bipolar Disorder Survival Guide, an international bestseller with over 350,000 copies in print and translated into eight languages. His next book, Living Well with Bipolar Disorder, Practical Strategies for Improving Your Daily Life, is due out in November, and we have already invited him to do an Open Mind program about it. So stay tuned and watch our website. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Today's program will run for approximately one hour with the last segment reserved for your questions. If you would like to ask either of our speakers a question, please type it into the Q&A that is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We appreciate your patience as over nearly a, a thousand people registered for today's program and we'll do our best to get to as many questions during the time allotted. Today's program is being recorded and will be available for viewing on our YouTube channel starting tomorrow. You can find that on our website, friendsofthesemmelinstitute.org. There you'll also find a library of past videos, 
from Open Mind programs, videos and photos from WOW, the Resnick Friends fundraising event that we had with Oprah, and photos and videos from our inaugural Gen Z Wellness Summit, sponsored by the Teen Advisory Council of the Friends that was held in February. Please be sure to check out our calendar of upcoming Open Mind events, including our fourth annual Open Mind Fil Film Festival that will be held in person this year for the first time on Sunday, April 21st, from 1 to 2.30 p.m. at UCLA. High school students from all over the country submitted over 20, 240 films related to mental health to be considered and a panel of preeminent judges selected the top 10 to be viewed at the festival. Don't miss seeing these outstanding films by the filmmakers of tomorrow who have a lot to say and a lot to teach us. Now, please join me in giving a warm Zoom welcome to Meg Kissinger and Dr. David Miklowitz. Thank you so much. Hi, Meg. Takes hey. me a little while to come on screen, as you can see. Uh, my my first question is, how's Henry? Henry was a French poodle in my world, but in every mm -hmm. other other people's world, he was the former Secretary of State. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he should have been a German Shepherd, but he was a French poodle. <laughs> well, I was I was very impressed with your book, which I just so happen to have a copy of here. This is while you were out. Uh, by Meg Kissinger, An Intimate Portrait of Mental Illness in an Era of Silence. Very impressive work. Um, I, what I thought we'd do is just to give you a, a five minutes or so, or however many you need to just tell us about the book, how you ended up writing it, uh, any major themes you'd like to acquaint us with. Sure, David. Well, thank you so much for that uh, generous introduction and, and uh Speaking of books that I'm a fan of, here is your wonderful book that I have just devoured. And I just keep petting the pages because they are so valuable to me. And I, where the heck were you 40 years ago when the Kissinger family <laughs> needed you? So my book is really the, the story of my family and what it was like growing up in the 1960s and 70s in a loving, wacky, Irish Catholic family in Chicago uh, that was really marred by an, Ill an illness that we didn't talk about, which was mental illness. And so as the years unfolded and one calamity kind of gave way to another, um, there were secrets that we kept. And being the fourth of those eight kids, I was naturally inclined to be nosy and wanted to know what was going on in my world. And I was lucky enough to have a career as a reporter. So I spent really my adult life asking complete strangers questions that I was too frightened to ask the people that I loved the most. And that is what it, what it is like to live with serious mental illness and why can't we do better in this country? Why can't we treat people with mental illness in more compassionate and, and, and better ways? So that's what I that's what I set out to do. And then finally, as my career was kind of coming to a close, I thought, well, time to turn that notebook around on myself and my family and come full circle and tell the story of what my family went through in the hopes that that might give some courage or enlightenment to people to tell their own stories. Very impressive. I really like your orientation towards the whole topic of social policy, as well as the very personal emotional story you've told. And uh, I guess my first question is, is we're going to hear more details about your book in a minute, but uh, despite the pretty awful family life you had and the losses, uh, you seem to have turned out pretty well. You're a skilled okay. writer, and <laughs> and investigative journalist, and you have a good... Yeah. You have your own family, uh, home life yourself. So maybe my question is really about resilience. I mean, how do you, uh, how do kids survive an environment like that and still come out on the winning end? Yeah, thank you for that question, David. And I think probably as you know, maybe best of all, you know, when, when little kids are going through this turmoil in their family, 
they don't know any different. I mean, that's the world that they know. So it was really funny when I put this book together. Um, you know, when I look back on my childhood, I I think of, of a very loving, happy family. I mean, certainly I know that there was sorrow and there was adversity, but that seemed to me to be the case in, in many families, especially in the neighborhood that I grew up in, which was lousy with huge Catholic families. It was nothing to have eight kids. We were just mm -hmm. an average family in our parish. But uh, with a lot of people come a lot of problems. And um, and with untreated or unidentified illnesses, that begets even more problems. So it was really only when I sat down to, and put this together that you could see these patterns emerging um, and I, and, and you can see that, that, you know, our family indeed did suffer more probably than, than most, but it didn't feel like it at the time. It just felt like, it felt like my family. Mm -hmm. Did it seem like, uh, you know, we know that two, two of your siblings, uh, died of suicide, by the way, I wonder how you feel about the language of committed suicide versus died of suicide, if that's yeah, important. Yeah, I, I don't like the word committed. I, I'm a convert on that. I, I really feel that it's more compassionately or more fairly described as dying by suicide. I think that's true. And also, uh, I don't particularly like being called being called successful suicide either. Yeah, because, right. <laughs> yeah, it's not a right. success. But uh uh, is there anything you can tell us about the two uh, siblings who who died, uh, took their own life, uh, yeah. that really stood out about them when you were growing up with them? Did you sure. see any? So, yeah, my my sister Nancy was four years older than I, so she was the second in line, and I was, as I said, the fourth. And Nancy came up. Uh, she always struggled. You know, she was a she was brilliant. She was beautiful. And she was brilliant, um, but she was also quite quite troubled, and that showed itself in naughty, what we would call naughty behavior. You know, she would ditch school, she would shoplift, she got into my parents' liquor cabinet, um, mm -hmm. and so just a lot of behavior that was suggestive of, of a kid in turmoil. But again, we didn't know that to be. Uh, an illness, you know, we, it was considered to be naughty behavior. So very valuable, like loaded uh, language. And, and our attitude was that she was acting out and it was a source of resentment and she would be scolded. Um, and so uh, she died in 1978 when she was 24 years old after many anguishing years. Um, she had spent years in and out of psychiatric facilities. So when she died, it was a great sorrow, but it was not at all a surprise. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other sibling who died was my brother, Danny, who was the second youngest. And Danny died 19 years later. So he was in his thirties, he was 33 years old. And Danny also had quite a lot of turmoil in his life. So these, uh, and others of us in the family struggled in one way or another. Um, I would say that mm, everybody had patches of, of behavior or times of where we were not settled. Um, I talk about in the book, we had a canary. We had lots of pets in our family as if eight kids weren't enough. We had a, we had a, that dog named Henry. Uh, we had lots of goldfish and all, all manner of animals, including a bird that we named Flip. And my mother finally realized that it was Flip the bird, which was kind of sassy. But anyway, when Flip would lose his feathers in the spring, when he was molting, he would stop singing. And we thought he was dying. You know, we were all freaked out that Flip was lying on the bottom of the cage. And my mother would always say, no, no, no. He's just having a hard molt and he'll be fine again. So that became kind of our code word for when somebody would kind of spin into a, a, an episode of sadness or listlessness or uh, irritability. They were having a hard molt. So really, um, it was just because there were so many of us and, and we were coming along in the 60s and the 70s, the world was a wacky place. Um, and there was not 
the language, you know, there was not the understanding. We did not have this amazing book. So uh, we didn't know how to talk about what was happening before our very eyes. Uh, and, and I've wondered so many times over the years what it would be like, how, th how things would have ended differently had we known how to identify that and talk about that. Hmm. And when you say identify it and talk about it, how would you have imagined your family might have talked about Nancy or, or Danny? Sure. So I, I think, you know, Nancy, especially because she was second oldest and her troubles emerged early. For my way of thinking, uh, I would have seen it more as an illness. So in those days, I'm, I, I just regarded her as a troublemaker and somebody to be avoided and mm -hmm. somebody to be resented. So uh, she came home from college at not quite the end of her sophomore year at the University of Colorado. This is 1973. And she was a mess. You know, she had mm -hmm. just gone off to campus and really decompensated. And she just was not able to go to class. She was quite depressed. She had attempted suicide. Um, and then there was a very public attempt. Well, I was, instead of sorry for her, I was angry with her because I felt like she was making my mom and dad very sad and upsetting the family and embarrassing the family. And I know now, you know, of course, that she was ill and she needed our compassion. But because we didn't talk about that in that way, it, it, it bred resentment and it, I'm sure it exacerbated the problem. And so then when she died, and I've talked about this, I talk about this in the book where on the night that she died, my father gathered us all into the living room and said to us very sternly, if anybody asks, this was an accident. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't really saying that to be mean, but of course we absorbed that as a some a, a signal to us that this is something, something very shameful just happened and something that we need to hide. Um, and so that really set the stage. Um, my dad's reasonings, I'm imagining, were really grounded in a couple of things. He was probably embarrassed that his daughter had taken her own life. He was also afraid that the Catholic Church wouldn't allow my sister to have a funeral, which was a very real worry. So, um, but how we received that was was very harshly, and and I've 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 often thought what message did that send uh, to Danny, you know, who then when his mental illness began to emerge some years later, he was very ashamed of that and not willing to come forward and to talk about the illness that he had. And I don't think he saw it as an illness. I think he saw it as a weakness. Very interesting. You know, uh, if, if I understand right, one of your first exposures to mental illness in the family was when your mom disappeared. Right. She was just sort of gone and without an explanation. Maybe we were told she was physically ill. And I've heard so many families say that, that uh, uh, they were never told their parent had an, a mental illness. It was that they were gone, they were taking a rest, or they were in the hospital, or uh, had work to do even, right? Uh, but that was numerous times. At some point, it became obvious to you that it was more than just uh, physical respite. Had when do you remember when you kind of came to that realization? Sure. So um, this was when I was not quite six years old, and we had just moved back to Chicago from Connecticut, and there were boxes all over the house. And I came downstairs for breakfast one morning expecting my mother to be there making the cream of wheat that she made for us all every morning. And she was not there. My grandmother was there, my father's mother. And when I asked about where she was, I was just kind of shooed away. Anyway, uh, it took quite a while to figure out that wherever she was is someplace they didn't want us to know about or why mm -hmm. she was gone. Uh, and then I, my, one of my sisters and I were whisked away that same day to go stay with an uncle. And we were not told how long we were going to be there. You know, again, this was all kind of cloak and dagger stuff that in the mind of a five-year-old is quite scary. Uh, and so, um, as it turned out, she came back, I 
don't know how long she was gone. It probably wasn't more than a couple of days or maybe even a week. But then sometime there, maybe like a month later, poof, she was gone again. So this erratic and unpredictable, just unexplained absences does a number on a little kid. But I finally figured out, you know, that it, it was just not, not anything that we discussed, but it was something to something again, something secretive and something to just be whispered about. And I can remember very clearly asking my grandmother, you know, well, what will I tell the nuns at school? And then my grandmother said, just tell them she's got pneumonia. So I knew that was a lie, but um, so then why do we have to lie about this? So it cast the shadow of shame without saying it, but that was the interpretation. And I think that's a pretty common phenomena in many families, especially in that time period. Well, and you mentioned too, religion, uh, you know, there's a very uh, concrete uh, outcome that could have occurred without there no be, there being no funeral. Right. And uh, yeah. of course yeah, people are, keep it to themselves under that condition. Sure. And it was looked upon as a, again, like a, a, a sin, a, a mortal sin and not worthy of uh, being buried in a Catholic uh, cemetery plot. So, um, yeah, the, all the signposts were there, uh, with all the, the, uh, institutions around our family to, to be afraid of this, to be ashamed of it and, um, not to be discussed. You think it's getting better in society in terms of, uh, stigma or are we still a long way to go? Well, I do think it's much better. Um, and, and I'd like, I'd like to, if I may just talk about that word stigma too, because Tom Insel, who I know has been on this program and somebody I greatly admire, the former uh, director of the Institute of Mental Health, um, talks about this in his excellent book, Healing, about the difference uh, when we talk about stigma, it's it's really meant to be, um, you know, that, that suggestion is the stigmata, which are the markings of Christ, you know, the on the hands and feet and the head. And that puts the burden on the person who's living with mental illness, when really what we're talking about is discrimination. So how people living with mental serious mental illness are discriminated against, and you talk about it in your book too, about mm -hmm. um, ways that people don't rent to people with serious mental illness or employers might not hire you or keep you on. Um, and so while I am so heartened to see much more robust public discussions of people's mental health or or the lack thereof, uh, we still do, I fear, discriminate against people with serious mental illness. Would you agree? Yes, absolutely. I think it's come a long way. I think people are more willing, especially uh, younger generations, uh, as we saw in the Generation Z Summit just a couple of weeks ago, um, these were all you know, teenagers and young adults who were really pretty out there in terms of what their experiences had been with mental illness. I was impressed. Uh, it's I not something that it. occurred in my generation or, or you, we're in the same yeah, generation. No, I love it. So, you know, David, our family stays very close. Uh, we're, we're so fortunate to have each other. And I think that's rare, especially families that have been through turmoil and, and you know, very jarring events like suicides. Um, but but I think we become more vigilant for one another and more watchful. And so um, we are quite closely watching this next generation because we're all now in our 60s. And so we have kids and now grandkids and we're watching that new generation come up. And I love it. I love how they talk to each other about what they're going through. It doesn't, I mean, it's still quite painful and they do still struggle and suffer, but thank goodness they are so much more candid and there's not that shame that we felt. Yeah. I'm thinking back to when my daughter was eight years old, hearing her and her, her friend have an argument about whether their friend, one of their other friends had OCD or bipolar. Ah. At eight? You know, at eight years old. And you yep. know, all this is very uh, you know, well known in, right. in uh, much younger ages than we knew about them. Yeah. Uh, 
but yeah, I agree with you. I think that's still a huge issue. People don't come out about it. And of course, there's there's the issues about uh, right. will someone fire you if you they learn of your mental illness or will someone refuse to date you uh, if they've right. met you in the area of an illness? Uh, I think those things are still very real. Well, you know, I was fortunate enough to have a career writing about the mental health system, which was a way to for me to scratch my itch you know, to know, to, to, as I said earlier, to ask these questions to complete strangers, to try and understand the world that I grew up in. Um, and I saw, you know, firsthand the ravages of this discrimination and, you know, the ways that we treat people and how in the old days, you know, we had all these institutions on the outskirts of town where nobody need to look at them or think about people who are, who are living with serious mental illnesses. And of course we closed all those down, which in many ways was a blessed thing. Uh, but we did, we overdid it, I think. We, you know, not, I'm not calling for a return to the days of the asylum at all. What mm -hmm. I'm saying is I think we need to also acknowledge that some people are so ill that they, they are in need of more comprehensive care than they're currently getting. And we're now seeing this on the streets, right? And in jails and prisons. And this is where people who are suffering and untreated for their suffering are ending up. So we've got to do a much better job in, the, in our society of giving resources and care to people who need it. And do you, is there a system anywhere in the world that you really admire in terms of mental health care? You know, Tom Insel talked about a system in, in I think it was Trieste, Italy, um, yeah. that had, you know, the community that really took care of its mentally ill. Uh, do you have a, a sense of what components uh, of care there might be in a system like that? Sure. So I can look no further than 90 miles down the road from where I am in Madison, Wisconsin, which is where assertive community treatment began. And, you know, in the old days, again, when people were finally let out of these god awful institutions, and um, the problem was that we didn't build all the catchment areas, all the centers that we promised, you know, the, the design of deinstitutionalization was genius. It was meant to, you know, set this up in such a way that there'd be a continuum of care. The problem is that the government didn't build half of these places. So people ended up on the streets. Anyway, uh, some very clever doctors in Madison, Wisconsin came up with this assertive community treatment, where instead of having people uh, come hop on a bus and come to the doctor's office, they would go out to where they where the people lived. And so that's a much more reasonable uh, and successful form. It's expensive um, and it's you, it's hard to find doctors and, and medical pro pro providers who are willing to kind of roll up their sleeves and go out into the community. Um, but it is a, a much more reasonable way, I think, to deliver care. Yeah, I noticed that you mentioned Dorothea Dix at one point in your book. And, uh, you know, I think of her as the person who really kind of pioneered that kind of treatment of social workers going to people's houses and yes. helping them in their own environment rather than expecting them to come to doctor's offices, which has obviously got some problems. Maybe it's better now that we have Zoom. I'm hoping so, that people can yeah. access care more easily, but got a long yeah. way to go. Yeah. You know, David, um, let right the week before my brother Danny died, he sent me a letter and the guy never wrote me a letter in his life. So this was a, an event, you know, when I received this letter, I was like, Ooh, what's, what's going on here? Anyway, as it turned out, Danny was talking about how acknowledging that he had had serious mental illness and it was a awful thing for him and it caused him to do and say awkward things. And he got into a lot of trouble in his life because of his bipolar illness. But at the end of the letter, he was basically apologizing um, and at the end of the letter, he said, only love and understanding can conquer this. And at the time, I thought that was such a cheesy thing to say, but then he died the, the next week. And I and, and those words were very precious to me. And I wrote them down on an index card and I taped it onto the side of my computer in the newsroom at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. 
And that became kind of my battle cry was to write these stories uh, to try to underscore the humanity of people who live with serious mental illness and find ways uh, to appeal to people, to love them and to try to understand them. And if you love people, you're not going to let them suffer and you're not going to kick them to the streets or stuff them in a jail or a prison. They are our brothers and sisters, you know, they are us. And so we need to, um, I feel this is my little soapbox speech, but I really feel passionately that the more we can see the humanity in people who suffer with mental illness, um, the better this world will be for them. I agree um, in principle, but I also wonder about situations like the one you wrote about, about your your friend who was the mother who uh, you traveled out to California with, with her right. son. Right. Uh, she was being torn up by her son's illness. And the more it seemed like the more she tried, the worse it got until she was suicidal herself. At what point do parents say, I've done what I can? Right. Uh, I love this person, but I have to let them go. Yeah, this is such a tough question. And I'm so glad you brought that up because it is agony living with people who are very seriously ill, mentally ill. And uh, they are they are a challenge. I mean, Nancy used to chase me around the house with a butcher's knife and mm -hmm. Danny did some awful things, you know, so they're cringeworthy and they're they're tra they're traumatizing. So I don't want to sugarcoat at all what it's like to have a, a beloved family member suffering because we suffer. Families suffer, too. And that's why, you know, it's just so important and so genius and so needed for your work with families of people living with bipolar because we're often so overlooked. I can remember when Danny went into the jail hospital and I tried to call them to tell them about our family history, that our sister had died by suicide and I was worried about his suicidal ideation. They wouldn't even talk to me. You know, mm -hmm. they just said, this, is, uh, this was many years ago, but no regard for what fa the families were going through. So they really need to be folded into the treatment plan. But in answer to your question, I don't have a good answer to your question because uh, it is hell on earth for a lot of family members to be living with this erratic, often, you know, sometimes violent behavior. Um, yeah, it's it's just, it's it's agony. And, and so I think you just, do the best you can. And sometimes that's not enough. And I think this is where support groups for relatives can be very helpful, hearing from other parents where they've drawn the limits, where they've set boundaries with their kids. Because sometimes uh, it's hard to decide, do I let the kid stay at my house tonight, even though he's violent? Or uh, do I give him money, even though he might buy drugs with it? These are really hard questions to be negotiated. Oh, yeah. I can remember Debbie Sweeney, the woman that you're talking about, telling me that she locked her bedroom door. And she said, that's what this illness does. It causes a mother to lock her bedroom door to keep her son out. So that's the reality of it in its worst form. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I try to remember that uh, this is, these illnesses can ebb and flow and that there is, people do recover, you can live well with illnesses like bipolar it's it's a challenge so you don't want to yeah it's a thin line between not wanting to sugarcoat it but also wanting to, to keep that hopefulness alive sure let me ask you a question about danny um you know one of the things that really struck me about his trajectory was that it really started with kind of a uh a public uh reckoning his yeah. behavior, uh, or yeah. maybe a public humiliation. He was sort of experienced the 1980s version of cancellation. Yeah, you know, he and uh, you know had done something racist and uh, was called on the carpet about it. Ended up going to jail. What do you think that? I mean, that must have contributed to his outcome in certain ways, don't you think? It certainly did. Yeah, I came across some letters that he wrote to the judge um, many years later. 
And Danny never really got over that. He was, he was tormented. It was his own fault. I mean, he did, he did commit this, it was an anti-Semitic act and it was meant to be kind of a prank, got it out of control. I, I bristle at that word prank because it was so mean spirited, but he was 18 years old and, um, he never, he could never really shake that. So again, you know, that was swept under the carpet. It was not discussed. It was not dealt with in a clinical way. Um, and it just, it snowballed. And so mm -hmm. it, that, that humiliation and that shame uh, contributed greatly, I think, to how he decided then to end his own life. Do you think he was in an episode when he did those things? I don't know. I mean, I think, uh, I don't know. I, he was young. He was so young. And, and with, there were a couple of kids involved. And it, it, it was, you know, complicated. It was a, they were exacting revenge for what he thought was a guy charging him too much for a truck repair. So it was immature to, I mean, that was, that's about the kindest thing you can say about it. Um, so I don't know if it was a, it was certainly lacking good judgment. And, mm -hmm. um, and then everything that followed from there, you know, his inability to accept a guilty plea and just take his lumps and move on. Um, it just fed into this fantasy that grew and grew. So it didn't help, uh, but I don't know that it was necessarily a by byproduct of an illness. Do you think if, uh, as you know, one of my soapboxes is getting families into therapy to deal with this stuff and That's a great learn soapbox. about the illness and to communicate better, do you think uh, had your family been able to be in some kind of therapy when Danny was doing that, would that have helped? Would they have been open? To it? I do. Yeah, I do. I, I, I think it would have given a message to him that we loved him and we support him but what he did was not okay. And that we, um, that we need to act, you know, reasonably. And yeah, I think, um, it, it only in, in having these fuller discussions and coming to understand why people do the things that they do, uh, that can only lead to, I mean, understanding leads to, um, healing. Whereas again, shame and secrecy, uh, really muddle uh, or or make huge barriers to healing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was, we needed to talk about all of this. Very wise. So, you know, we only have about five more minutes before we uh, do some Q&A. Can you give some uh, advice to families, parents of uh kids who have bipolar disorder or psychoses, what, what would you tell them about uh, how to make this go better or to, how to decrease the discrimination they may feel or the secrecy? Yeah, yeah I, I think boundaries are so important. And, um, you know, that's one thing that you learn in these like NAMI family to family meetings or other kind of support groups. You put the mask over your own nose and mouth first. Uh, because mm -hmm. really you can, you can go down with the ship. You know, you want to make sure that you, that you're healthy. You can't help your child if you are not well and healthy. So, you know, all the things that they, they sound like a cliche, but they're not, you know, plenty of rest, good exercise, uh, good diet, you know, all those things. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a burden. It's a, it's a, to have a child who is, suffering, especially with something so erratic as bipolar, um, is, um, it's, it's, it's really just a hell of a, a hell of a burden. So be kind to yourself, uh, know that you're, that you're doing the best that you can. Um, something that I have to remind myself to say, especially when I'm talking to people about suicide and, and really a lot of this book was me kind of going back and walking through the days that Danny and Nancy died and doing kind of a post-mortem and wondering well, what could we have done differently and how could the outcome have been different, which is an impossible answer to know. Um, but, um, you know, my, my big takeaway is don't beat yourself up. You know, it, it's, 
some people's illness are so catastrophic, just like with cancer, you know, there's stage four cancer, there's uh, heart disease that's out of control. Ditto for mental illnesses, you know, despite the best efforts of families, the sad fact is that sometimes the illness is, is, is so catastrophic that the person's going to die from that. And if that happens, it's such a sorrow, but then just to know, find, find ways to, to give yourself a break and, and to find the peace of knowing that you did all that you could. Very good. You know, uh, related to that, uh, you had mentioned at one point in your book, the kind of drive to return to the places where certain traumatic events occurred. I think the example you gave was going to the train tracks, uh, where Nancy had died. Um, why do you think people want to, why do people, when they've had traumatic backgrounds, want to revisit the scene? What are they yeah. trying to do psychologically? Well, I think in, in my case, uh, because it was never discussed and that was, that was a, I just didn't know, was she lying on the tracks? Was she running alongside them? It, it's just a human curiosity. Uh, ditto for Danny, you know, who died by hanging and just, just to know um, what was in their mind at the time and again, I'm not going to change the outcome. And I didn't want to kind of marinate in these macabre details, but I needed to satisfy my curiosity. I needed to know, it's, uh, it's my nature um, to be curious and want to know. So I was, the fact that I, we were never really, never had those discussions, it was, it was unsettling to me and it was unfinished business. So I, I was eager for the chance to stare down those beasts. I imagine so. Mm -hmm. Anything else you wanted to mention before we get to the Q&A? Any, uh, any other thoughts for, for families or parents? I just think, <laughs> get this book. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm plugging your book right left. But no, truly and honestly, David, like it is it is gold and 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 the more discussions we can have the the more knowledge we can have the, the better understanding uh the better off that we will do so don't be afraid to talk about this stuff it's not your fault uh lean on people who do know answers push for more funding for better better mental health uh studies and support the work of david and others and and just uh it is an illness in the same way that, again, like AIDS was and, and how the arts community advocated and agitated for a better profile in the mental health community. Clout. So, yeah. Absolutely. Good analogy. Hi, Vicki. Hi, Meg. Hi, David. Thank you so much for this really fascinating. enlightening, fascinating discussion. Meg, you are really a gifted storyteller and writer, and thank you so much for so generously sharing the story of your family's journey with mental illness in order to help other families who share similar struggles. Your care and compassion and vulnerability about the childhood that you bore witness to is, is really, um, I, I'm struck by your, the, the words that you tape to your computer from Danny, love and compassion, and you really show those in this book and today on screen. So thank you. Absolutely. And David, thank you for sharing your vast knowledge, your expertise with our audience and for the great compassion and thought and care that you give patients with mood disorders and their families. And I have to say the families that work with you and the patients that work with you are very fortunate to have such a caring, wise doctor. Thank um, so thank you both. And now up to the questions. Um, we have quite a few questions, so I'm gonna get started right away from Frank. Staggeringly moving book, Meg. Thank you. As a journalist, you covered the mental illness beat for decades when very few were. What change have you seen over the years that gives you the most hope? And what change do you still wish to see that has yet to happen? Yeah, thanks, Frank. That's a great question. The change that I've seen is, is again, a greater willingness to talk about this. When I started writing about mental health as a beat, as a um, reporter, 
uh, 25 or 30 years ago, I was a very lonely person. It was a little bit like that old Maytag, you know, uh, the repair washer guy. Repair guy or dryer repair guy. Uh, I was the only one out there doing that. Now there are entire mental health desks. The Seattle Times has a mental health desk with a dedicated editor. So um, news organizations are starting to get religion that this is, you know, a very important area to cover uh, more aggressively. There's, it's still not as high profile as Taylor Swift at a football game, but we still, we need, uh, you know, we need higher profile. So I'm encouraged by that. I'm encouraged by a, a more robust uh, form of discussion. Um, yeah. So that's what I'm hopeful for. And, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about this, how um, I believe that the pandemic engendered a lot of empathy for people. They realized what it was like to be lonely and frightened and have some of the same emotions, anxious, a lot of the same emotions that people who have serious mental illness have. So there's a, I think there's a greater empathy. Um, and I'm, and I'm hopeful. I'm an optimistic person. And I just, I really feel that we're um, starting to tear down those walls. Thank you. You're a pioneer and a trailblazer. You were the first when nobody else <laughs> was, was. So thank you for that. Um, it's wonderful that more are, are now covering these stories and interested in learning more, but you are the pioneer in this field. So thank you for that. Um, we have a question here. What advice do you have for families whose child has a mental illness and refuses medication treatment and does not admit they have a problem. That is so, such a, a burden. Oh, that's a real, real, real tough one. I don't have an easy answer. I mean, it's it's awful. And when you don't have an insight into your own illness and you don't know how, that you could be dangerous uh, to yourself or to other people, again, boundaries, you know, you, you make it conditional, you know, th that um, unless you, that, then that doesn't always work. You know, it, trying to force care on somebody, it's so tricky. And, and that's where we're seeing this played out, you know, in places like New York city and in LA, you know, where there are people living on the streets and, um, efforts to try to compel people into care who don't want it. Um, it's very, very tough. This sounds very squishy, but I really feel like we need good language. We need we need better education of what illnesses look like and so how we can talk about them as illnesses and, again, take away that um, st stigma or discrimination or the sense on behalf of the person who's suffering that they are a bad person, that it's their fault and ha help them to see that it's an illness and their illness needs treatment. And the treatment includes medication and includes therapy and includes help. So way, way, way easier said than done. But I believe that it begins with taking the, all those loaded words and the, and the guilt out of the equation. Thank you. Would you David. agree? With yes, I would. And just one thing I might add is uh, it's very important to have a conversation with the person who's refusing treatment about what their fears are, what their assumptions are about what admitting to a mental illness might mean. I mean, for some, it means, hey, that means I'm going to be locked up in a hospital and giving, given all sorts of horrible medications, or I'll be the uh, kind of excommunicated from the family. Uh, I think you're going to learn a lot just from talking to the person and kind of clarifying their fears and uh, and there are sometimes mistaken assumptions. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. You may not change their mind, but uh, at least you can get on the same page. Well, and, and programs like the Open Mind that is educational and the NAMI programs, the Family, family, family to Family, all help educate as well. So um, I think those programs are supportive of family members and and make normalizing conversations 
about medication, about treatment, um, taking the scariness out of them. Um, a comment from Victoria, what is being done to support the metal, mentally ill? It seems as all, it seems that all we do is talk about how horrible our society treats those with mental illness, but nothing really changes. David? <laughs> well, um, that one. Yeah, I know that it's, uh, it may appear that nothing changes. I do think we are making slow progress in our research and in our treatments are certainly better than they were 20 years ago. Uh, I think our our treatments have become more humane. We don't just stick people in hospitals and and you know with no follow up. I think at least most places are able to make that happen. There's certainly more concern about mental illness, not always for the right reasons. Some people are only concerned about it for uh, because they're concerned about gun violence. But nevertheless, there's more awareness. Uh, I hope it continues in that direction and we need uh, obviously more research, but also personal stories like the one that Meg has told, I think really does produce uh, societal change over the long haul, but then maybe I'm overly optimistic as well. Something I would put a plug in for is more robust insurance coverage, right? And, and more affordable care. So uh, it's, uh, I have family who live in New Orleans, not to call out a particular city, but they can't find a provider. And um, a lot of cities are strapped. In New York City, you know, uh, if you can pay out of pocket, you can no problem finding a therapist. Um, half, more than half of all counties in the United States lack a psychiatrist. So uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it is diff, uh, I think child psychiatrist, I should say. But it's a uh, it's it's a real chore. It's a real struggle to to find providers and to be able to afford them. And insurance companies need to be a whole lot more generous about providing care because it's just as critical for somebody to get possibly you know some treatment for bipolar as it is for cancer. Mm -hmm. We really Definitely. mental health mental health parity. Um, and we're still not there yet. Uh, comment from Mary. Dr. Milton Miller, who was the chair of psychiatry in Madison during that first wave of institutionalization, ended his career as chair at Harbor UCLA, where he championed an ACE and ACT team in the early 1990s. He was an inspiration to many of us. Do either of you know? Mm -hmm. No, I know of him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know you mentioned Wisconsin, so I thought right. that, yeah. just Badger Pride. Yeah. <laughs> Badgers. Um, yeah. Uh, several questions again about family members who refuse to take medication. So obviously this is a huge issue. Um, here is a comment for, oh, well, um, from Michelle who is in, uh, finds the NAMI family to family very helpful and says it's so hard to navigate the medical world as an advocate for a loved one. And mm -hmm. um, can, can you both comment on that? I mean, it is really hard to access the system when you need help, um, when, when it's, it, it's something that you, your family hasn't experienced before and you, you need to get help. Any suggestions on how to begin to navigate a very complex system? Uh, I would say first go to either a NAMI or a DBSA meeting. D DBSA is a Depressive and Bipolar Support Alliance, which is basically other families who have bipolar disorder in the family or NAMI. Uh, and you will learn from other family members where they've gotten help and how they've gone through those steps. That's probably the most direct way. Yeah, and you mentioned this in your book too about not don't don't be so deferential to medical people. You can push back and ask them why are you prescribing this medication? Exactly. <laughs> Excuse me. So be um yeah be a passionate advocate. Mm -hmm. now, a lot of people don't know that you can even ask those questions. Are you supposed to just take the pill and and go away? But you can have a negotiation with your doctor. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, question for Lawrence for Meg. 
Excuse me. Were you ever able to put yourself inside of Danny's mind as he was going through an episode? And what kind of treatment did he receive, if any? Yeah, he had very spotty treatment. Um, and in terms of putting myself inside of his head, I was able to do that a little bit when I came across these letters that he wrote to the judge, excuse me, towards the end of his life. And it was really sad. You know, I think that was the saddest part of writing the whole book was finding those letters. I mean, it was inf interesting. And I'm, I'm, I think I'm better off knowing that, but it was very sad. Um, and I could just see that he felt like he was out of options. Um, and so what kind of treatment that he got, it was spotty. It was really when he went to jail, he ended up having some manic episodes and ended up punching a Chicago cop. Um, Oops. And charged with, yeah, not a good idea. Good idea. <laughs> yeah. And charged with um, aggravated assault. And um, we were thrilled. We were so excited. I remember when my dad called me to say he'd been arrested. I was like, yay, now he's going to jail and he'll get help. Um, and that was naive. I mean, he, he, they didn't compel him to take medication in jail. They ultimately uh, did tell him that he's not going to get out until he does take medication. So then he ultimately did. But there was precious little follow through and uh very poor discharge plan there was the family wasn't prepared for how he would be acting when he got released so excuse me it was um yeah just very spotty and very erratic and um yeah so uh, i i i think again families need to be passionate and need to be, uh, it, it's a, again, a fine line, you know, you want to protect yourself and, and give yourself boundaries, but fight for the rights for the people who are suffering. And, and again, it may be too simplistic to say it this way, but there are people who are suffering. They have an illness and they're suffering and they're not bad people. They're not, it's not a moral defect. It's not poor parenting. It's, it's a, it's an illness and it needs to be regarded as that and, and treated as such. I think that's a message that needs to be communicated at a larger level, that it's it's not just poor morals or not trying hard enough or laziness. It is a true illness in the way that any illness is. Right. Well, thank you both. Unfortunately, we're out of time, um, but again, thank you. Remind everyone of the title here because apparently some people missed it. While you were out by Meg Kissinger, highly recommend it. Absolutely. It's a must read. And again, thank you for the gift of this book, um, for writing it, sharing your story, Meg. David, thank you for all that you do. And thank, thank you, you for always saying yes when we ask you to speak. And we're really excited to highlight your book in November. So everybody, you have to tune in. And David Miklowitz is the featured speaker. Um, thank you everybody for the privilege of your time. Uh, we look forward to seeing you. We have so many exciting programs coming up. One with Thomas Insel, who was mentioned. Uh, he's coming back with a colleague of his, Dr. Jeremy Noble, who is the author of Project Unlonely, which is a huge topic these days, loneliness. And so I hope that everybody will come out for that, come out for the Open Mind Film Festival if you live in the Los Angeles area or you feel like taking a trip, um, because these films are really must see. And also in person on May 15th, Patrick Kennedy will be with us at UCLA in conversation with Dr. Jonathan Sharon, who's the former director of the LA County Department of Mental Health. So at that, I wish everybody a good, safe evening, stay well, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, Vicki, for all you do. Thank you, what a privilege to be here. Thank you, our privilege and our honor. Thank you.